let's get into some other issues in terms of women, women's health. And I think that the biggest question I get uh, in this sphere is around uh, estrogen dominance. So we've talked about this on previous podcasts, but let's go over it again for people because I know this will benefit people. And, and then let's take the conversation from there. Good. Okay. So women, primary sex hormone is actually have estrogen, but in a menstruating woman. So basically, you know, as a little girl, baby, we're born with all the eggs that we'll ever have in our lifetime, different than men who produce sperm, uh, turnover sperm much more quickly, but we're born with about one to 2 million eggs in our ovaries. And then we have about 400,000 eggs by the time we hit puberty. And then once we start ovulating, we actually only release probably four to 500, which is about 1% of what we're born with. But every single month, the brain is telling the ovary to get some eggs ready and it will get anywhere from one to 20 little follicles ready. And those follicles make estrogen. And so in a menstruating woman, we make estrogen for about two weeks. Then we start making some progesterone. We make a little more estrogen and then the cycle starts back over. Um, we need both estrogen and progesterone for this cycle. And so this idea of what we call estrogen dominance. Now, every single month, depending on how many of those little follicles get stimulated, our estrogen levels change from month to month. And that's why hormone testing is so difficult in women is because it's cycle specific. So if I check your estrogen on the first day of your cycle versus the 14th day versus the 21st day, every single day, it will be different. So it's difficult to test. Like if I'm going to draw your blood, right? You're going to come in like daily for a blood draw. So there's salivary testing. Um, there is uh, a test I can do in my clinic where you pee on a strip every single day of your cycle. So that's called cycle mapping. So we can kind of look at what your estrogen metabolites, progesterone metabolites look like over the course of your cycle, but it's difficult to test hormones. So that's what people need to understand. Now, estrogen and progesterone are created at different parts of the cycle, right? Like I said earlier, progesterone is only made after ovulation. So progesterone is essentially supporting the lining of the uterus, the endometrial lining in anticipation of a pregnancy. And then when you don't get pregnant and the cycle starts, progesterone goes away and we're back to estrogen. Either overproduction of estrogen, or it may be a relative lack of progesterone. So that's the thing you have to understand is just because someone's quote unquote estrogen dominant doesn't mean that they're making boatloads of estrogen. It could just mean that they also have a relative lack of progesterone. And like I said, you have to be ovulating to make progesterone. So think of something like PCOS. So a patient is constantly stimulating the ovary um, they've got a lot of androgens being produced by the ovary. They've got a lot of estrogen being produced by the ovary, but then they're not ovulating. So they don't make progesterone. So that's estrogen dominance. And, um, we also make estrogen from our androgens. So if you have a lot of testosterone, like people do in PCOS, that testosterone can get what we call aromatized into estrogen. So that's further increasing this estrogen burden. Now, estrogen is an amazing hormone. It, it is, it's good. It's actually, <laughs> this is totally off subject. Another rabbit hole we could go down, but estrogen is like, a, it's a performance enhancing drug. I was, somebody was sending me an article about the Olympics and I'm like, estrogen's performance enhancing. Like it's a really good, it's a good thing because when you're in your estrogen part of your cycle, um, you're actually, uh, you uh, have a high insulin sensitivity. You recover better from workouts. Uh, you have increase in muscle growth. It's super protective to our heart and our brain and our bones as women. And so estrogen is a great thing, but we don't want it to hang around. So estrogen is what I call a use it and lose it hormone. So we want to use our estrogen, have it do its magical things. And then it goes to the liver and it goes through our detoxification pathways. I hate the word detoxification, but basically it goes through all these pathways in our liver. It gets packaged up, sent into our gut. And then it gets excreted uh, mostly in our, uh, our feces and, and some in our urine. And so it's use it and lose it. So, but you can actually recycle your estrogen. So if, you're, if your beta-glucuronidase activity is high in your gut, you can actually reabsorb it. So there's tons of reasons why women might have excessive amounts of estrogen. Maybe they make a lot. Maybe they have too much body fat and they're aromatizing all their androgens. Maybe they have a bad microbiome gut issues and they're reabsorbing their estrogen. So there's a ton of reasons why people might have a high estrogen burden. So then clinically, what does that look like when you have estrogen dominance? So um, you can have super heavy periods. So that's uh, a very typical one. Um, you can have breast tenderness. 
you can have um, uh, a variety of symptoms when you have this estrogen dominance. But um, like I said, it's difficult to test. So everyone always comes in like, oh, check my hormones. So it's, it's not as easy uh, to just like come in and get your blood drawn and your doctor's like, oh, you have too much estrogen. It's not that easy. It's kind of the overall clinical picture, you know, that we're really looking at and, and what the patient's, you know, problems are, but um, it can have downstream effects for sure.